what precisely is commitment for life? And for that matter, what precisely is the United Reformed Church? And does it really matter whether the church focuses on global justice or not? And how should our activism be expressed in an age of apocalyptic climate catastrophe? My name is Kevin Slayman, and I'm a minister in the United Reformed Church and want to share something about our denomination's global justice program, Commitment for Life. I'll begin with a brief historical outline of the United Reformed Church that explains why we as a denomination are so passionate about global justice. Because I, like you, am interested in how to do justice, walk humbly and love mercy at a time of massive inequality, global corporate hegemony and relentless climate breakdown. To understand the United Reformed Church, we need to go back to 1633 the year Charles I reissued James I's Book of Sports that allowed dancing, archery, leaping, vaulting and other such harmless recreations on Sundays, really blowing raspberries at the Puritans who at the time were calling for stricter observance of the Sabbath. In Wales, the Reverend William Roth in 1638 lost his living as the Vicar of Llanbachus because he opposed the local bishop on the matter leading to the creation of the very first non-conformist congregation in Cymru, which I had the great privilege of pastoring for a few years. Fast forward to 1662 and the great ejectment, where thousands of clergy lost their living. Uh, this oppression gave rise to a genuine resistance movement against the hierarchically structured church, with its power vested in the elite who ruled over everyone else. Dissenters included the Anabaptists, diggers, levelers, Puritans, seekers, ranters and Quakers, people who had the temerity to suggest that those in power did not actually know what was best for everyone else, nor did they perhaps have anyone else's best interest at heart but their own. Really fast forward again to 1972, when some of the descended denominations of those who were early nonconformists gathered into what we now call the United Reformed Church who at the time had no intention of still being around for a very long time as a denomination, believing that through genuine dialogue and ecumenism, the church would eventually be one. In other words, we must recognize in the very DNA of the URC, there is a desire to subvert the power of elites, to push decision-making power down to the local level and to show solidarity for the victims of systems of domination and hierarchy. Of course, every URC member will immediately put up her hand and say, we don't always get it right very often. In fact, we have to come to terms with John Calvin's role uh, uh, in, in, in the rise of capitalism, his theological justification of interest-bearing debt, and his doctrine of God's uh, election being implicitly used to justify the pursuit of wealth as a sign of God's blessing and approval. Also right now, the URC is acknowledging our role in the transatlantic slave trade and the legacies of slavery that, air, that express themselves in white privilege and racist assumptions and attitudes that are for the most part completely unconscious, except of course if you're a black member that is, who knows exactly only too well the depth of white privilege in our societies. Today the URC has around 40,000 members in Wales, Scotland and England with about 1,300 congregations though I think COVID will speed up church closures. We have around 500 active ministers and church-related community workers, and a good number of congregations are constituted as LEPs, or local ecumenical partnerships, with the Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, and so on. So our USPs include reform theology, separation of church and state, vesting power in the local church uh, meeting, and not in bishops and moderators, a strong emphasis on social justice. Our antecedent denominations uh, uh, were the first to explore the ordination of women, Constance Coltman, uh, in, in 1917. <laughs> Commitment for Life, then, is the URC's global justice program. Our primary aim is to enable the local congregation to engage effectively with issues of global justice. We focus on placing prayer and advocacy first as we follow in Christ's footsteps towards radical freedom, justice and fullness of life for all. We work with our partners, Christian Aid and Global Justice Now. 
With Christian Aid, we focus on four regions, Central America, Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, and Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. I'm not too sure how long we'll be in Central America, but watch this space. We will help the local congregation to opt to pray for and to support and learn about one or more of these regions. So the origins of Commitment for Life can be found in the energy and the resolve of the 1% of the appeal, which, as you may recall, was a kind of voluntary tax that we would be given to development of, of what was then called the Third World, or developing nations. Uh, we supported the establishment of the Fair Trade Foundation and Jubilee 2000 and other such activities. We're still going strong after 40 years, but we know, in spite of all the energy and all the excitement, in spite of all the activism, all the prayers, all the money raised for development, one look at the deepening levels of inequality for our sisters and brothers in Africa, Asia, and for the Caribbean, one look at the global economic architecture that is ripping through forests and oceans and indigenous communities, well, I think we can fairly say that we have pretty much failed. Development is deeply problematic because it is predicated on an economics of perpetual growth. Wealth disparities have grown significantly worse, natural habitats are being paved over or polluted, and the sixth mass extinction is, going, is not going away. And the poorest in Honduras, Bangladesh and Zimbabwe have to deal with the very worst effects of the climate chaos. Throwing money at the problem of inequality is a little bit like throwing petrol on an oil fire in the hope of putting it out. Our debt-based economics is designed to push wealth to the top. It never ever pushes wealth to the bottom as much as we try. Exhortations to congregations to dig deeper into their pockets is clearly not going to change the situation. So, what are we to do? What is God calling us to do in the face of the triumph of the market over practically every aspect of our life and our planet? What do we say to our congregations whom we promised 40 years ago that your actions can make a difference? Is despair our only option? Well, as a fervent follower in the footsteps of Jesus, you might have guessed that I don't think despair is, is, is in the cards. In fact, I see despair as just another form of denial. I think what we need as Christians is to go back to the Bible, to become still, to listen again to Jesus who calls us out of empire, who calls us into an utterly new way of seeing and being. What we need to do is to wake up and to come out Come out is the original meaning of the term ecclesia or church. So we've got to come out of these systems of domination. What the Christian scriptures called cosmos, this domination system, which unfortunately has been translated as the world. We need to come out of systems of empire, just like those early Welsh, Scottish and English dissenters did that. But only this time we need to go much further than even they did in the recognition that not just our theology, but also our assumptions, our lives, all of these have been shaped by the assumptions of empire. And this includes money, markets, debt, the way we organize nations, the state, democracy, business, communities, churches, and charity. There is not a lot of time to do all of this, and we have to be honest that it may, it may be too late. Certainly if you look at the chemistry and physics of climate disruption. But try we must and will, without stopping our current work, that we're doing at the moment, we need to take seriously the pressing and urgent need to reimagine the entirety of our work. I'll leave you with that to think about uh, and to really wrestle with and to pray about. God bless you.